Whose life would be better if you knew more C++? Whose life would be better if your coworkers knew more C++? Let's get started. All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the Back to Basics track and welcome to this particular Back to Basics talk, the special member functions. Allow me 10 seconds to introduce myself. My name is Klaus Igelberger, and I'm perfectly okay if we stick to the first name because as I've realized, many Americans are not able to pronounce my last name anyway. So I'm Klaus and I'm working as a C++ trainer slash consultant. Today, I want to talk about the special member functions. And this is the functions that a compiler might generate for you. So let's remind ourselves what these functions are. So which functions does the compiler generate within a class? Well, of course, it's the default constructor. It's the copy constructor, the copy assignment operator, the move constructor, the move assignment operator, and last but not least, the destructor. These six functions are, depending on the situation, that's exactly what we'll explain, um, generated by the compiler, and that is the so-called special member functions, because they are indeed special. First of all, because they are generated by the compiler, and second, of course, they are very basic fundamental functionality of a class. Copy uh, functionality, move functionality, cleanup, and of course, default initialization. So right away, in order to just explain the terminology already, if you hear people talking about something called rule of six, then they're actually talking about the, these six special member functions. Basically, they say all of these functions are somewhere defined. If you hear people talk about the rule of five, however, then this means that they talk about these functions, all of them except for the default constructor. That one, okay, is not so special after all. It's probably the most boring out of these six. These five, the remaining five, are probably the most important. Then sometimes, still, you might hear people talk about the rule of three. Traditionally, people mean that uh, you have somehow defined the two copy operations and the destructor. It's not quite up to date anymore, but still might be relevant. And sometimes, and hopefully more than sometimes, hopefully most often, people talk about the rule of zero, which means that the class does not have any explicit definition of any of these six uh, special member functions. And already at this point, this is good. This is kind of the best that you can have. This is your goal. Uh, so we set this goal for ourselves, but of course I have to explain why this is a goal, why this is something that I want to achieve. So let's talk about these six special member functions in order. I'll start with a default constructor, then I'll make a jump, talk about the destructor, then I'll talk about the two copy operations, and then about the two move operations. All right, and so let's start with a default constructor, which could be indeed a pretty boring story, because just explaining when the compiler generates this is actually not a lot of information. The compiler generates a default constructor if you have no other construct in your class. So, for instance, this widget, that widget does have a default constructor. I can create this widget either in this form or in that form. Parents, unfortunately not possible, that's a so-called vexing parse. However, if you have any constructor in your class, any other constructor, then the compiler doesn't generate the default constructor for you anymore. And that may be totally reasonable. Sometimes, hopefully only sometimes, it might, might not make sense to have a default constructor. And by defining or just declaring any other constructor, this, this default constructor is disabled. That's nice. Good to know, but a default usually is quite a good uh, thing to have. But also, the compiler is not able to generate any default constructor if any of your data members or any of your base classes cannot be default constructed itself. So, for instance, if I do have any data member that does not have a default constructor, then the compiler cannot just do anything. It doesn't know how to default construct a widget. So it will throw up the hands in the air and say, I have no plan what you want to do. And then, again, you don't have a default constructor. 
which is kind of reasonable, I believe. Now, as I said, it would be a little boring if this would be all the information, but we can perhaps talk a little bit about the initialization, the task that a default constructor is supposed to do. And let's start with this widget. This widget has an integer, which now for me is a representative of a fundamental type. It could also be a float or a double. I do have a string s, which now for me is a representative of a class type, a so-called user-defined type. And I have another special fundamental type. I have a pointer to an int. Now, in the main function, I create a widget in this form. I use default initialization. Think about this for a second. What is the initial value of these three data members? What is the initial value of i, of s, and of pi? Now, I assume you have an answer pretty quickly, or a gut feeling. So, the integer is not initialized. The string, on the other hand, is initialized properly to an empty string. But also the pointer remains uninitialized. And that's definitely something that you want to avoid. That's definitely something that will later haunt you because in a random address, anything is pretty difficult to distinguish from a real address. So, no, the pointer, definitely not. The pointer, it, uh, sh the pointer should not be uninitialized. So, if you don't have any default constructor, then all data members of class type or user-defined type are properly initialized. That's good, you know, based on their own uh, initialization routines. But data members of fundamental type are not initialized. Now, instead of default initialization, I'll let you use the so-called value initialization. I just use an empty set of braces. This luckily fundamentally changes the behavior. Because this class doesn't have any declared default constructor, this now means that the integer is properly initialized to zero. The string is, as before, initialized to an empty string, but also the pointer suddenly is null pointer. And that, of course, is absolutely superb. Absolutely amazing. This is what we'd like to have. So in that particular case, value initialization has the added bonus that because of the, any missing default constructor, we are first zero initializing the entire object before we then afterwards construct all the class types. Yeah, so the string will then afterwards be initialized by its own uh, default constructor, which doesn't really change anything. But the zero initialization, first of all, takes int of the i and the pointer. Very good indeed. Absolutely great. So if you do that, as just explained, First, the object is zero initialized, then um, all the non-trivial data members are default initialized. Good. However, if you now start to, oh, guideline first, prefer to create default objects by means of an empty set of braces. So value initialization is actually a good thing in general. However, if you now start to write a default construct yourself, and then by means in this form, you just uh, have an empty default constructor, then even this syntax will not save you anymore. Again, the integer is uninitialized, the string is still default initialized, but the pointer again is uninitialized. If you write a default constructor yourself, now if you define it in the class, then you are responsible. And this one is just not doing anything. So. If you write an empty default constructor, again, all the data members of class type, the user-defined types are initialized, but not the data members of fundamental type. So in other words, if you write this, you have to do something yourself. Definitely better than an empty set of braces is to ask for the default. To ask the compiler, please generate this for me, because then, good thing, um, everything is working out again. So the int is initialized, the pointer is initialized, and, and the string anyway. Equal default counts as a definition. 
which is at this point not a problem at all. Uh, there may, may be other situations, but um, this equal default actually may also give you a couple of bonus effects. For instance, no accept. That's something that you might not have thought about before, but equal default actually is something where the compiler now starts to think about all the details, and you might, for instance, in this situation, since C plus 17, get the no accept for free. Pretty good indeed. So, please avoid writing an empty default constructor. And I mean the one with uh, an empty set of braces. Prefer to let the compiler provide a definition or define it by equal default. Now that's definitely a step forward. But of course, of course it could be that um, you want to initialize the object to a specific state. So let's assume that we need uh, the value 42 for the integer what else, that we need uh, cppcon for the string, again, what else, and I don't have a particularly clever uh, value for the pointer, let's say we use null pointer. That now definitely sets the value to all of the uh, desired values. Okay, however, the comment is lying a little bit. Actually, this is not initialization, that is assignment. I'm assigning 42. I'm assigning cppcon, I'm assigning the pointer. An assignment means that I'm changing an existing object. Initialization, from a terminology point of view, however, always means that I'm calling a constructor. So, if assignment changes an object, uses an assignment operator, then where are the elements initialized, where the constructor is called? Well, before you enter the body of the constructor. Before you enter the body, there is something called the member initializer list. And this is where you should put all of your initialization. So the string should not be initialized, should, should not be assigned in the body. Now it should be probably initialized in the member initializer list. And yes, for the int and the pointer, it doesn't really make a big difference. But still, in C++ we consider it to be very good style, very good style indeed, to initialize as much as possible in this member initializer list. So the int, the string, and the pointer are now initialized to the values I desire, and it's clean. That is good. This is exactly how, how the code should look like. So a very simple, straightforward um, default constructor, an empty body, which is great, because this basically means that I initialize things and I do not waste time by first initializing to something and then changing it later. So please remember the responsibilities of the default constructor. Everything, in most cases at least, should be properly initialized. Then also note that I actually filled the member initializer list in exactly the same order as I had the, um, as I had the member in the de list of declaration. So I go back one slide. I did initialize the integer first, then the string, then the pointer because that is exactly the order that I have them down here. That's not optional. That's actually a binding order. You have to initialize these data members in exactly that order, in the member initializer list, which is good. There's a good reason for that, which is unfortunately going a little bit beyond what I want to talk about. And then also prefer initialization to assignment and constructors. That is what Core Guideline C49 tells us. It is definitely good style, it is considered to be very valuable. All right, the default constructor. Let's switch gears. Let's talk a little bit about the second special member function, the destructor. Every class has a destructor. That's something that hopefully is clear already. Every class has a destructor. Either you write it or the compiler will generate one for you. So this class, has a destructor because the compiler generates one. And if you declare or define it, um, a destructor, then of course the compiler will not generate any one anymore because um, you have now provided one. Okay, so that's the simple part. However, of course, destructors are there for a reason. Compilers are supposed to clean up an object. When the lifetime ends, all outstanding responsibilities should be taken care of. Now the default, the compiler generated destructor, calls the destructor of all data members of class type. 
Yeah, so if I have a string, that destructor is definitely called. But the compiler generated destructor does not call anything for any fundamental type. So strictly speaking, there is no destructor for these kinds of types. No, not for ints, not for pointers. But now in my example, I actually do have a pointer. And this point is, of course, now for me, a representative of a possible resource. Perhaps it doesn't own. Then everything's fine. But perhaps it does own. And if it does own, the uh, compiler-generated version, the compiler-generated destructor doesn't help me at all. The compiler-generated uh, version would not clean up the pointer, would not clean up whatever is behind that pointer. So in that case, you have to create this, write this destructor yourself. You would have to delete the pointer explicitly. OK, typo, without the tilde. That is important, of course, else you have a resource leak. However, I believe this is something that people do quite, quite well. And destructors very often are not a problem. Usually destructors, however, are a sign that you have to deal with other functions. And that's the ones that we are now talking about the copy operations and the move operations. So please just remember, provide a manual destructor if there are any outstanding responsibilities that are not handled by the destructor of a class type data member. So if you do have any owning pointers, then you do have to write one yourself. And do not provide an empty destructor. That's a bad habit. If the destructor doesn't do anything, let the compiler generate it for you or define it by means of equal default. But just as an empty default constructor, an empty destructor is kind of strange. All right, I see a question by um, Jay Castell. What happens to classes that have only static members of not fundamental types? A static member is not truly really part of an instance. So a destructor is not concerned about your static types. Static data members, so in other words, the ones where you add static before that, basically live for the duration of the program, not for the duration of a single instance. So once again, the destructor is not concerned about them at all. The destructor would not clean this up. Now, it depends on the type. If you have, um, you said, not fundamental types like strings, they're created at the beginning of the program, they're destroyed at the end of the program. All right. So let's talk about the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator, the copy operations. First, the signature. The copy operation, the copy constructor, is thus the constructor that takes one argument of the type of the class. The first signature here, that is the default. That is kind of the canonical form. This is what you should use in 99% of all cases. You could also, if you wanted to, remove the const. This would still be the copy constructor. However, I personally would vote this as suspicious. I've seen one class in the standard library that had that auto pointer, which now is history. Apparently, it wasn't a good idea. So leave it in const is indeed suspicious. And then technically, you could also pass by value, which however is not a good idea at all. This may result if you pass an L value into a recursive function call. And so we can forget about this basically right away. So you either pass by reference to const or by reference. The copy assignment operator is pretty similar. The copy assignment operator is a, the assignment operator that takes um, one argument of class type. By default, by reference to const, again, this is what you want to do in 99% of all cases. Sometimes, but again, I would rate this as suspicious, you might um, do it this way, or you might um, remove the const. This is still the copy assignment operator. Or, and actually here it might make sense, you might actually pass by value. By this, doing that, you can actually implement copy assignment in terms of copy construction and move construction, depending on what you have. But this actually might sometimes be a nice compromise. It might reduce code a little bit. So here it's possible. All right, let's talk about when these operations are generated. The compiler will always generate the copy operations. 
if not some points apply. But if you do have a widget against some class and you don't do anything special, then this widget does have the two copy operations. Definitely. The compiler will always try to make sure that there is a working copy operation. The only reason resents why there's no copy operation is if you write them, okay, then they're still there, of course, but the compiler will not generate them anymore. All right, so your version will be used. Then if you have a move operation, then the compiler will actually implicitly delete the copy operations. They're not gone, not gone at all. They're implicitly deleted, which essentially means if you try to copy, you will get a compilation error. A uh, copy operation has been implicitly deleted. So again, there's always a copy operation. It just might not be available. And also, if you have any base class or data member that cannot be copied, then the compiler just cannot generate the copy operations for you. Also in that case, however, they're not gone. They're implicitly deleted. If you try to copy, you will get the according error message that explains why it is not copyable. So, every class has the copy operations, essentially. Every class has a copy construct and a copy assignment operator. Either you can copy by means of these, or that they are implicitly, or if you want to, explicitly deleted. But every class always, under all circumstances, has the copy operations. Pretty important to keep in mind, indeed. You cannot get rid of them. You cannot delete them. You cannot replace them with something. These two functions are something that we'll always have to deal with, somehow. All right, let's talk a little bit about the... Oh, I'm sorry, there is a question which I should address. So the guideline says to prefer an empty constructor. However, that relies on the use of your class to use the um, um, braces to zero initialize the data members. Isn't that a concern? Well. What you can, of course, also use is in-class member initializers. If you want to make absolutely certain that your, um, that your class is properly initialized, especially the pointer, then you'd have to do something yourself. You should not rely on the user to do the right thing. You should write your class such that it's definitely initializing everything to the values that you need. So just saying that it is a good habit to actually use braces. This is not a wrong thing. Absolutely not. But you as a designer of the class should not rely on the user to do something. That would be a problem. I agree. All right. How are the copy operations still there if they're implicitly deleted? All right. Equal delete actually is not a get rid of it. Please read equal delete more as equal disable. Now you're asking the compiler to disable it. Equal delete counts as a definition. So you do define the function, and if it's defined, it's there. And essentially, I hope, I hope indeed this clarifies it, it's always part of the overlet set. If you try to create an object, then the compiler will always, so if it took, takes a look at all the constructors, it will always consider also the copy constructor. It's always there. If you say equal delete, equal, uh, delete it just cannot be called anymore. It can be selected in the overload set, and then later you get the error message, oh, it actually has been deleted. Now, so, to some extent, equal delete is a misnomer. It's not gone, it's not deleted, removed, whatever, it's disabled. And also implicitly deleting means it's just disabled. Okay, Alan has a great question, I believe, but a pretty long one. I'll try to tackle this later. Okay. So let's talk about the default implementation. What does the compiler do when it generates the copy operations? The copy constructor is, in, is basically done this way. So you may have a base, so some colon base, uh, imagine that. Bases are just initialized directly in the member initializer list. And then the co compiler does a member-wise copy. So I is copied, S is copied, the pointer is copied. The compiler generates a default 
implementation of this copy constructor by doing a member-wise copy. And exactly the same is also happening in the copy assignment operator. The compiler would just generate one that does a member-wise copy. If you do have a base, several bases, it would uh, start with these, it would copy the base part, then it would copy the int, it would copy the string, it would copy the pointer. That's it. It's a very, very basic forward uh, way to generate this copy operation, which is great if you have ints and strings, but it might, might, it depends, not be such a great idea if you do have pointer data members. So again, I assume I have a pointer, which now for me again is representative of some resource, an owning resource, something that I have to clean up. Now, we talked about this before. I said that in that case, you should write a destructor. So let's write a destructor. However, obviously, the default implementation that the compiler provides is not working perfectly. If you just copy the pointer member-wise, then actually we duplicate this pointer. If you have two widgets and I copy the widget, now have, there's two widgets out there that hold the same pointer. Both of these widgets naively would imagine, would expect that they own this resource and both in their own destructor would call delete. Very bad idea. That, of course, is something that we definitely should avoid. This kind of shallow copy is, is of course, a problem. So, in order to fix that problem, I now create a real copy. Of course, there is many, many options. Now, in my example, I create a real copy. So, if um, the other uh, has a real pointer, I create a copy of the other resource. And else, I set it to null. And here as well, I do not just copy the pointer, I create a new resource by new, assuming that this is the right thing to do. As I said, there's, there's many, many possibilities. New resource might not work, of course, in every situation. Still, we're not done yet, unfortunately, because in this line, we are now changing our pointer in the assignment operator. And as I've said before, the assignment operator is actually critical. The assignment operator changes an existing object, changes the ownership. And I might already own something, some old resource, some old resource that actually, yeah, I'm responsible for. This is why I wrote a destructor. For that reason, I definitely should do something about my old resource. So it's my responsibility. I first of all have to delete my old resource. Okay, type again, delete PR. I should delete my own old resource. Now it's okay. Now I've dealt with my, um, my old resource and now I can take another one. Or if need be, I just uh, get a null pointer. Okay. Still, It's suspicious. I would create this as very suspicious indeed. We call a cleanup, we call a delete outside a destructor. And indeed, this now can result in a lot of problems. For instance, a special case that can happen in case of assignment, if you assign to ourselves. So if you have some widget W, and I say W equal W. Now that's what we refer to as self-assignment. In that case, this reference, this other, would be myself, me. If that happens, then the first thing I do is I delete my old resource, my own resource. I continue, I continue, and at this point I actually find that, well, it's still the old pointer, I try to copy it, but of course I try to copy from something that doesn't exist anymore. That's a classic bug. Uh, it's classic forgetting that self-assignment is a, is a real thing. It can happen. All right. So you do realize that because we write this function ourselves, because we manage this resource, 
suddenly we have to deal with many, many, many more details. It's amazing how many details are suddenly coming uh, upon us. In this function, we suddenly have to deal with delete and with new. We also have to deal with, um, of course, copying all the base classes and data members, but we also have to deal with null pointers and potentially dangling pointers. Yeah, my, my own pointer here, my PR, is a dangling pointer right here. Boah. How could this little function become so complicated in such a short time? And indeed, it can happen quickly. And you hopefully do realize that all of these problems are just coming because of the pointer data member. The pointer is, is to blame. If I would just have an int and a string, everything would be fine, but the pointer suddenly messes this up completely. Not a good idea. You should, of course, always try for code that is simple, code that is reliable, code that you can look on and actually say, it's working, it's correct, I know that it is. And I've not even talked about exception safety here, so um, there's indeed a lot to think about. It is not easy to write such a function yourself. There's always something complicated, but there is an easy way one approach that is kind of easy. And that is what we call the temporary swap idiom. The temporary swap idiom works the following way. You create a copy first, a copy of other. This other is copied into temp. And of course, this calls the copy constructor. A function that was actually much, much more straightforward. A function where we did not have to think about possible um, uh, this delete, null pointers, um, and uh, dangling pointers, it was definitely simpler. So we trust that function, we use it. Now we have a copy, temp, but well, that's not the right position of this copied thing. Actually, I want to be the copy of other, not temp. So directly afterwards, I now swap the state. I swap the state of other and myself. I'll show the swap function in, in two, three slides, don't worry. So I swap the entire state. And that's actually pretty beautiful because it does the right thing and we actually build on existing functions that we already know, functions that we already trust, namely the copy constructor and of course also the destructor. The destructor will now destroy temp at the end of the scope. So temp will be destroyed at exactly at that point and will clean up my old resource. Yes, I, I don't have to care, take care of the, about this anymore manually. I can leave it to the destructor of temp. And indeed, that's kind of beautiful. By the way, this solution is safe for self-assignment. That solution is also uh, exception safe, even strongly exception safe, which I now leave aside um, too deep. And it's short. But now, of course, there's critics in the audience that will complain that this is not the fastest possible solution. Yes, absolutely. But it's simple. And if you do not have any spe specific performance requirements, if you're just going to get it done, if you need it, that's actually one very nice way to go. But of course, if you want to do the right thing, if you want to be fast, then of course you could uh, write this function yourself. For instance, special case, if both widgets, both other and myself have a valid pointer. So if both pointers are valid, then I'm a typo. Um, I could actually copy everything explicitly. I could copy the um, the base classes, I could copy my data members, and not just the, I don't copy the pointer, I actually copy um, the resources themselves. So I do reference the pointers and I copy the resources by means of their own copy assignment operator. So I can make this truly a very hierarchical thing. I copy, implement my own copy assignment by means of all the other copy assignment operators. And the nice thing is that, again, I don't really have to handle self-assignment in this case. The data members will do this on their own. That's perfectly fine. If, however, 
one of these two pointers is not valid, and of course I assume that this is possible, then in the else branch I could handle this by means of the temporary swap idiom. That may be a better way of doing things, a faster way, but again one that of course makes this not as nice anymore. Uh, it's definitely a little bigger. The swap function. Of course, the swap function that you should write um, is now a member function. A member function that actually takes a non-const reference to another widget and a function that first allows the compiler to actually also use standard swap and then simply swaps all the data members. The ID, the name, the resource and potentially also base classes, whatever you um, might have. That's the right kind of swap implementation. I do not explicitly uh, and qualified use std swap, std colon colon swap, but I first asked the compiler to consider std swap, to also consider it, and then I do an unqualified call. That enables ADL, the argument dependent lookup, to actually pick up the right swap for special data members of some other namespaces. So that's what core guideline C83 um, tells you. For value-like types, consider providing a no except swap function. All right, now that's nice. But now we have all of these member, uh, special member functions. We have the copy constructor, we have the copy assignment operator, we do have the destructor. And that is exactly what people refer to as the rule of three. If you define any of these three, and for, all, for us it was the destructor that we wrote first, then it is very reasonable to actually think about all three. Simply because, well, they're all connected. If I have a special implementation my destructor, it definitely will affect, I say definitely, most likely will affect the copy assignment operator. So they are indeed connected. So if you write one of these three, please consider all three. Do not leave a sum aside. And indeed, this is what I see often, um, too often, unfortunately, that copy operations are just ignored. That's, a, that's very unfortunate. Now, sure, again, there's critics that say that um, this rule of three is outdated since C11, because there's two more, the move operations. Okay. I give you that. Most of the time, probably, it's not the one thing anymore. We consider the rule of five in a bit. But there is actually still a use case, which I'll cover at the end. So a reasonable, a good reason why I would use the rule of three. All right. However, all of the problems, all of the problems indeed, are because of the raw pointer it's probably reasonable to actually use some data member that knows how to clean up things automatically, like a unique pointer. Raw pointers are usually trouble indeed. Owning raw pointers, which shouldn't exist to the core guidelines, but we now replace this by a unique pointer. That means that automatically we do not have to think about cleanup anymore. And that means that the destructor can now disappear. We do not have to think about a destruct anymore. Unfortunately, we still have to think about the copy operations. We do have to because a unique pointer cannot be copied. So the default generated version that a compiler would generate, the one that would try to copy, just doesn't work because now this is one of the data members that cannot be copied. Now, of course, you could think of, a, of another data member like a shared pointer. A shared pointer can be copied, and it also, of course, deals with resources. But before now, we now move on, please do realize that this absolutely fundamentally changes the semantics of the class. Before, I was actually talking about a widget that where each widget owns a resource. Now we're suddenly talking about a lot of widgets that share one resource, shared ownership. That is indeed something very, very different very different semantically. So that is not a general solution. That may be a special case if you indeed want to have shared ownership. So let's assume for a second that this is what you want. 
And you probably should think about this again because shared ownership is troublesome sometimes or often even. But assuming that we decided to use a shared pointer, then we actually can also get rid of the two copy operations. A shared pointer can be copied. It can be cleaned up. Everything suddenly is automatically generated. The compiler version works perfectly. And suddenly this is so much easier. Suddenly we don't have to think about any of these yeah, copy operations that destruct anymore. Much easier. And this is exactly what we refer to as the rule of zero. Classes that don't require an explicit destructor, copy constructor, or copy summer operator are so much easier to handle. And that's why you want to go there. This is why you should strive for that to make your life easier. Not to have a, a good evening, to not have to worry about any bug in the implementation. All right. So let me check if there's any, uh, any questions. Okay, Thomas asks, when the copy constructor applies a memberwise copy, types with cons members can't be copied. Um, so a simple answer about that, you should try to avoid const member data. Initially, it sounds like a good thing because const is great. <laughs> Actually, it may be the most valuable keyword in the language, but const data members are not. Because exactly, they mess with uh, the copy operations. They also mess with move because obviously you could not, could not move from a const member. Please, that is something that you should avoid. Const members and reference members are troublesome. Now, the um, copy assignment operator and also move assignment and um, even the move constructor are affected by that. The compiler cannot generate these anymore, the, the, the assignment versions, assignment op operators. That's not a good thing. Definitely not. There is a core guideline that says exactly that. Avoid cons members and reference members. I just remember the, the number correctly. Might be 82, but this is a wild guess. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Um, uh, Jesper asks, what is the scenario where you would do self-assignment? Okay, let's just say that it could happen. I don't say that you want to do self-assignment. I say it is an operation that should work. You should actually implement a, an assignment operator such that it also can deal with self-assignment somehow. Not for the case where you do it explicitly. No, that, that will not occur. Never, I believe. I've not seen it. But for the case where it just happens, uh, imagine a, a, um, an implementation of some algorithm. Uh, as a special case, indeed, an object might be copied to itself. Yeah, a swap that swaps the same thing. It may happen. Your code must be prepared for that. That's the entire reason. Yeah? Self-assignment is, uh, is important to, to take care of. All right, and Ellen asks, what about using weak pointer? Okay, weak pointer is, of course, a very special thing. Um, let's don't go there. Um, shared ownership, as I said, is something that you want to avoid anyway because it's hard to 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 reason about. Unique pointer is usually much more your friend. Um, that's what you should use primarily, say 90% of the time. All right, so let's talk about the move operations. And I know as soon as I say let's talk about move, um, half of the people sign off immediately. Oh no, move. Okay, I know this is always a big topic. It always sounds very complicated, but here's a little incentive to actually motivate you to go through move. Oh, very nice indeed. Very cute. And note that I actually take great care to actually um, include everyone, so dog fans and cat fans alike, are now very happy. I just have to apologize. Um, that's something I didn't really think about before. Um, I actually indeed did forget about people that have uh, a cat hair uh, um, or a dog hair allergy. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but okay. You now should feel motivated to go through the move stuff. So the signature of the two move operations. The move constructor takes 
usually a reference, an R value reference to non const. That's the default in 99% of all cases. Technically, you are allowed to add a const. It's possible, but uncommon. I've seen it in production code reasonably. If you don't really want to move, if you just want to see that any R value reference is passed, then this may make sense, but it's very uncommon indeed. And the move assignment operator is absolutely similar. Yeah, the assignment operator that takes one argument of class type by 99% reference to uh, non-const, R value reference to non-const, and um, you can add a const, but again, very uncommon special cases. But all of these count as move operations. Now, when does the compiler generate move for you? Well, if you have nothing inside your class, especially no special member, then the compiler will generate move. So that widget, pretty much empty, has no move operations. But if you write them, declare or define them, then of course the compiler will generate these two. Then, if you do write any destructor or any copy operation, then the compiler would actually not um, generate move anymore. It would be gone, gone in, uh, completely. It's not implicitly deleted as the copy operation, but move indeed would be gone. So any, uh, that destructor or any copy operation would actually make move disappear. And of course, your data members and base classes is something to do with that. It's a little more difficult, though, as with the copy operations. If your um, data members or bases can be moved but not copied, of course, then you still can move. That's perfectly okay. The compiler knows what it should generate. It can call move. If your data member cannot be moved but copied, still the compiler knows how to generate the move operation. Your data member, or also base class, would just be copied instead of moved. Okay, it's not perfect, but that's the best we can do. Still, move kind of works. But only if your bases or data members are truly immobile, in the sense of they have neither the move or the copy operations. So, in other words, indeed, there's no way to get it anywhere else then the compiler does not generate the move operations anymore. And again, they're not implicitly deleted, they're gone. There is no move. They don't participate in the overload set. Now, the default operation. What, how does the compiler generate the move operations for you? Well, the move constructor does a member-wise move. So the base part would be moved, the data member i, the data member s, the pointer, they would all be moved. A member-wise move of all the data members. The move assignment operator does exactly the same thing, kind of. It's just doing not move constructions, but move assignments. So the base part would be moved into the other base part, i would be moved, the string would be moved, the pointer would be moved. So a member-wise move of all the data members. That's what move is doing. And again, this is perfectly fine if you have just so, things like ints, strings, and other um, data members. But again, I do have a pointer. Because of that pointer, again, I write delete resource in my destructor explicitly. And you can imagine that this, of course, again, has an impact. In the move constructor, we're lucky we don't have to do anything. But in the move assignment operator, again, yeah, oh, first of all, but for both functions, we have a shallow copy again. A shallow copy that, again, will cause trouble later. If you move a widget, there's two widgets, perhaps then eventually even more widgets that believe they own this resource, they will all call delete. It doesn't work because moving a pointer essentially copies the pointer. So again, we have to do something explicitly. And please again note, it's the pointer. The pointer makes your life harder. So I now clean this up by in a move constructor exchanging things and in a move assignment operator by first deleting my old resource explicitly and then exchanging. 
sounds so simple. But again, very, very suspicious. I do have um, a delete outside the destructor. And if you do have an explicit delete, then please check if all the operations are actually doing the right thing. That exchange here is indeed suspicious. It is suspicious for the special case. Move to self. So, move assignment by uh, self assigned by means of move. So you have some widget W. You could say W is equal to std move W. Yes, and if you do move to yourself, then you first delete your own resource. Exchange would make sure that you keep the pointer and you would end up with a dangling pointer. Very, very problematic. So yes, a delete pretty much always is suspicious. You have to think harder about the code. You have to take care of the special cases. It's always a little more trouble. Therefore, either we um, do things explicitly, we first assign a pointer, then set the other pointer to null pointer. That works. It's a different order than exchange would provide. That is something we could do. Or alternatively, we could also use, again, the temporary swap ID. This time, however, by moving other. We now rely on the move constructor and then swap. Now it's the same swap as before. That works. And yes, again, it's not the fastest implementation. The faster one is the one that I just showed to you, the uh, version before. But that is the version where you do not have the suspicious delete. That is the one that makes us feel a little more safe, a little more secure that we actually have done the right thing. That's good. All right. Now, we are kind of again at the rule of three. This time, however, we have the two move operations, the struct and two moves. But now from experience, you remember that, of course, in that situation, we also should deal with copy constructor and copy assignment operator. They're not gone. They're still there. As I said, every class has the two copy operations. So now in total, actually, we deal with five functions. And that's what we refer to as the rule of five. So if you do have to write a destructor for some reason, then most likely you will also require the two copy operations and the two move operations. Suddenly you have to think about all of them. And of course, that kind of sounds like work. So again, the raw pointer causes all this trouble. The pointer that we have to take care about explicitly, manually. What we should do is again to think about how to deal with this in a better way. And the first thing I would now again propose is to move to a unique pointer. A unique pointer takes care of deleting things. That means we can actually get rid of the destructor. But a unique pointer also perfectly implements the move operations. So I can move a unique pointer. Very nice indeed. So I can get rid of the two move operations and the destructor. I just cannot get rid of the copy operations if I need them, if I really want to have copy. So unfortunately, we cannot go to the rule of zero right here. Again, if you would assume this that a shared pointer would work, then again, note that, of course, it again fundamentally changes the semantics of the class. So this is not an equivalent um, um, implementation now. If you would have a shared pointer, then we could also get rid of the two copy operations. Then again, we would arrive at the, the rule of zero. So again, this is what we should strive for, but not at the expense of changing the semantics of a class. That's not okay. Semantics first, and then you have to see what uh, is the proper implementation. But I hope this is a point that you now got on your own. Seriously important for my, from my point of view, try to reduce the use of pointers. They make your life so much more difficult. And here, this is the, the core guideline, uh, R21, prefer unique pointer over shared pointer unless you truly need shared ownership. And, and trust me, you don't need that often. And it's not an excuse to have a simple implementation. It's a different semantics. All right. 
to summarize the guidelines. Okay, let me check. Okay, um, Alexandre asks, isn't widget uh, now uh, the, the signature of the move constructor, but with a const? So is widget in parens widget const ref ref, um, isn't that really a copy constructor? No, it isn't. It isn't um, because, of course, the move constructor accepts our values, only our values. The copy constructor, the cons widget ref, would accept both L and R. So, in a special case where you actually don't have any data members but still have something special uh, about move, and I say, uh, indeed, I have seen this once or twice at maximum in my, uh, my lifetime so far, um, that was code where indeed it was only about detecting our values. It was not about moving. Then this actually makes sense to have the const, but it's not the copy operation. L values would not bind to the R value reference to const. So it cannot replace the copy operation, not completely. Okay, I hope this answers that. Um, Michael uh, asks, why does move assignment operator return a widget ref instead of a widget ref ref? Okay, this I didn't explain. I apologize. Returning a widget ref is the canonical return statement of any assignment operator. Always. Um, you always return a reference to yourself. So you, you yourself, of course, um, usually are an L value. But it, it's something that it, it indeed is a canonical return statement. This is what all assignment operators do, not, not just uh, the copy and move assignment operator. You actually may change the return type. That's perfectly okay. But then I've seen static code analysis tools that complain that you do not, do not obey to the convention. So stick to this convention. It's the right thing to do. You always return reference to uh, an L value reference to yourself. Okay. So let me address the other questions in a little bit, just to make sure that we actually cover these guidelines. So once again, core guideline C20, that is the rule of zero. That is the thing that you should strive for. So this class here, this widget that has a pointer and a size, yeah, apparently allocates an array, makes its life harder than it should be. You should consider not always, of course, but most of the time, consider manual resource handling as suspicious, as difficult, and you should leave that to some classes that already do that. So that widget could also be implemented in terms of a vector. That's so much simpler, and that would definitely achieve the rule of zero. C21 also says, uh, that that's the one that says rule of five. If you define or delete any default operation, define or delete them all. Now, in this class, in this widget, I have a unique pointer, which is good because that definitely takes care of delete. So I don't need a destructor. But we've seen before that we need the copy operations. So now we can copy a widget. But now you have to remember all of these rules, these intricate rules, um, this rule set which operation influences the other operation. Well, because of these copy operations, we have no move anymore. If you write copy, there is no move. So we would now um, get back the move operations. We can simply default them. That's all we need to do. Please compile it, generate them for us. That's good. However, in order to show that all of them are working properly, we now also default the destructor. We do that in order to avoid any questions, in order to just show we have thought about this, it's okay. And it's super simple and super quick to do because we can use equal, delete, uh, equal default. That is the rule of five. So if you write any one of these five, please write all of them. That makes your life simple and it definitely does not require anyone to remember this artificial rule um, set of rules. It's, it's not bad, bad rules, it's great, but complicated. All right, so note that equal default indeed um, defines all of these um, special member functions. Yeah, it's a user defined, user specified um, operation. Of course, you're also free to delete the copy operations explicitly. You can say, no, I don't want to delete, 
but please make it visible. Then everybody has an idea of what you have in mind. So if you have a unique pointer and if you say, no, copy is not for me, delete the copy operations and default the others. No questions from anyone. Okay. And I've said that sometimes the rule of three may actually still make sense. Sometimes, indeed, um, like in this class, I might have no move operations. That actually has a special meaning because now if you try to move, we are actually falling back to copy. So this object is not movable, but it is copyable. But if you now delete the move operations, if you try to move, you will get a compilation error. And so interestingly, it indeed does make a difference whether you do not write them or if you delete them. There is a difference. Equal delete says it is there, but it cannot be called. And so as a final takeaway, follow the rule of five if you want to delete to default or delete the move operations. But if you want to have copy as a fallback, if you don't need move, but you want everything to be uh, handled by copy, then you might still follow the rule of three. Then you just do not mention, uh, do not delete and default the, um, the move operations. I would add a comment though. It's kind of a um, nice thing for people that read your code. They now understand what you have uh, in mind. But from a functional point of view, you follow the rule of three. Okay, and the last guidelines, please be suspicious of manual resource cleanup. That is the reason why we, um, why we talked about all of these details, the pointer, the cleanup. That is what made all of this difficult. And try to reduce the use of pointers. All right, thank you very much. I'm over time by one minute. I apologize, but I'll answer all um, remaining questions in um, Gather Town. So please give me a minute, then I've logged in, and then I can answer all your questions as, as long as you need me. Okay, thank you again.